the lawyers in the room, they love to come in and bill you and learn from you rather than advise you. They always love telling you what I can't do rather than coming up with a solution what I can. So, and, and the City of London, whereby I hope there's some lawyers in the room today, um, you guys are going to make some really big bucks on this thing, so stick around, you might get to learn something for today. <laughs>
idea what are the incumbents going to actually say about this new digital assets revolution what are they going to say about the tokenization of everything right like how is that going to yeah i mean it's really interesting to me i think i said when we met that that's where like real are the real world assets or existing financial assets meet crypto world right token world right and bringing the two together it's kind of a nice it's a nice bridge between the two worlds almost. yeah yeah um, it's, it's but you've just got to have all the parties involved in it and right. it's listen it is going to go that way um i just don't know if it's going to be in one year or ten years right, right. so you kind of got to be patient, but yeah. um, at least uh, there is something to report on. At least there is something for me to look at. And if yeah. it makes makes the world a better place with regards to T0 and transparency and lower costs, right. then, I mean, we we'll probably have something quite interesting there, so. We've got a really interesting panel, uh, a group of uh, people from uh, various facets, various uh, dimensions of, of what we're gonna be talking about. Um, first of all, I'm David Pleasance. Um, I've been a longtime senior partner at Deloitte with a management consulting background. Um, I'm currently uh, focused on uh, the digital space, cryptocurrency, tokenization, and uh, uh, have an investment business. Um, I'm on the board of uh, Tokeny, and uh, uh, this, is, this is an area of uh, focus and interest for me. So maybe I could start by just um, asking each of the panelists to uh, make a brief introduction. You, you uh, already have bios for uh, our various panelists, but just to uh, uh, start things off, maybe I could just uh, go down the table and ask each of you to make a brief introduction. Certainly. So uh, I'm Damon Bow. I'm currently at uh, Mint Partners. Um, I've been there about nine months. Um, primarily, I, I'm, I work on traditional assets and, and, and currently working on traditional assets, but within the business development space, one of the asset types that we're looking at is this whole um, digital crypto blockchain uh, technology. Alexander Azoulay, I'm a managing partner for FGH Capital. We are based in California and Europe. Two years ago, we looked into um, listing our group of funds on Euronext and other listed markets in Europe, and we spotted the blockchain as a, as a real opportunity to make it simple, more simple and streamlined to list and make our venture fund accessible to more people. Um, we will launch in end of Q1 19 our first tokenized fund from Luxembourg and from uh, the US. So we chose to work with uh, local regulators in uh, major uh, uh, venues in Europe. Uh, that will be end of Q1. Um, George Salaba, I'm a co-founder of Body Credit. It's a Swiss fund, um, and our mission is to um, open venture capital, which we think is a very exciting asset class to a much, um, much greater audience of, of investors. And we want to do it by allowing people to buy a small stake in our fund and then sell it or hold it if they like. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of Cointelligence. We conduct data research and analysis for the crypto economy. We're mainly focused on ICOs, STOs, coins, and exchanges. Um, I myself have a background uh, as an angel investor for the last uh, 10 years. And uh, about a year and a half ago, when I uh, discovered blockchain and crypto, I understood that it's uh, the future for all of us and um, started to uh, follow the industry. And I understood that there's uh, significant uh, problems and gaps. And we, as a part of what we did, we developed uh, an impartial rating system for ICOs. We shifted that rating system into STOs uh, because of the market uh, change. And the last thing that we're also doing is hunting down uh, scammers. Everyone that is trying to scam the public, uh, there's many different types of scams. Um, we identify them and we are calling them out. Good morning, everybody. First of all, thank you so much for allowing us to speak at this wonderful conference. It's great to see um, more attention on the STO market. Um, it's been a wonderful conference, very well organized, and it's a real privilege to be asked to be here. My name is Shane Kehoe. I'm the co-founder of SVK Crypto. SVK Crypto is a firm based here in London. We are solely focused on cryptocurrencies and blockchain technologies. We put our capital to work with regards to our fund, which is a $50 million fund. We're in partnership with Block One, which are the guys behind the ESIO protocol. We see the opportunity right now as it exists as the biggest opportunity I've seen in the last 20 years. 
Of course, it's not going to happen overnight. We've got a 10-year view, but we've never been more excited to deploy capital into this amazing space. And it's wonderful to see the space becoming more mature with the evolution of the STO market. Great. Thanks, everyone. And um, with uh, that last comment, maybe we can start with some of our discussion topics. So um, we're, we're seeing a shift in, uh, in focus and priority um, from ICOs to STOs. So, on maybe we could start with you and, and you could give us some of your perspectives around what's the difference between ICOs and STOs? Um, why are STOs uh, gaining in popularity? Um, so maybe we could start with you, please. Sure, thank you. So, the first uh, part I would say is that um, we've all seen that with the ICOs and the, we had a wild, wild west Everyone practically did um, anything that they want to do. Um, people asked for investments from investors without uh, enabling the investors to have any kind of real rights. Um, we had cases where the founders were promising the moon. It was very clear that they will not be able to even reach their first milestone. They were raising millions, tens of millions, more than 100 million dollars and more. And it was very clear that one, they will not be able to achieve what they're promising. Um, and two, uh, the investors are completely hopeless. I think that the main change that we see from ICOs to STOs is first and foremost the security of the investors to have the rights. Second, um, uh, the second part is I think that because of the change from utility tokens to security tokens, and when I say change I'm talking about something that doesn't really exist at the moment or is very rare because until today no one, at least not someone that I know, uh, any individual or company actually managed to prove um, that utility token is worthwhile. There are a few projects that are looking promising to me, but it's a long way before they will be able to actually achieve it or prove it um, as a use case. Um, the third part um, of the change that I see is because we know that with STOs, the security of um, banks and governments will be much better. They will feel much more comfortable with that mechanism. And I think that it will allow many of the investors that did not go into blockchain and crypto until now to consider it. Um, and um, the last part, the way that I uh, see it, is that the confidence of the public um, might come back to the industry, might be back, because um, there's going to be many less scams out there. It's going to be much harder for them to scam the public. And when I mentioned scams uh, before, we have different kind of levels of scams. There are scams that are just out there trying to steal the money from the public by faking a website, faking a company, faking the whole team. But there's other types of scams of founders lying about many different factors regarding their ICO, and now it will be an STO, and they will have serious problems with the governments, with the regulators, if they will be lying about these uh, 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 types of uh, the, the different data that they publish to the public. And just one, as one example, I'll give um, many founders that we've seen say that they raised, for example, $10 million and more, while they didn't even raise $1 million, just as one example. Another example is that many founders are putting partners on their websites, claiming that they have partnerships with big 500 fortune companies such as Google, Microsoft, IBM, and more and more, while it doesn't really exist. So I don't think that founders of STOs will allow themselves to do these kind of things because they will definitely go to jail. Uh, it's not a question. So that's uh, uh, the general uh, uh, overview of how we see the shift from uh, ICOs to STOs. And obviously, if I had more time, I'd uh, continue talking about it more. <laughs> 
Thank you. Anyone else like to add some comments to that? Well, in many ways, it was a catch-me-if-you-can phase uh, early on in the market. People were kind of whitewashing utilities for, uh, for equity. Uh, and now you see companies swapping UTT tokens for, uh, for, for, kind of for qualified financial instrument tokens. So they're kind of rushing to whitewash what they've done last year or two years ago for the most serious projects. Um, and obviously, we'll see this trend going on for the next years. And I agree that it will, it will, it will be long I mean, to educate the market and to switch from a wild, wild west, which you just mentioned, to a restructured market where, like any financial instruments, you will have to comply with local regulation. And Jane, from an investor's perspective, um, what have you seen as some of the differences? Well, I, I think they're totally different. Um, the ICO market was almost like a crowdfunding 2.0. Um, it was a, um, a opportunity to invest if you wanted to take that level of risk and, and, and volatility into uh, a conceptual, um, into an experiment, into a white paper, which was majority of times quite poorly written. Remember, this wasn't a prospectus from Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley. Every line was not um, okayed and verified by a, by a legal representative of the firm. You were getting into something that was an idea. And in some cases, it worked. In the majority of cases, it didn't. Um, you take the risk. You want returns. All trees do not grow to the sky. That market decoupled for obvious reasons. There was no filter with regards to quality control. But it had to happen. And for, for that reason, we have matured. We have looked at that space. We have looked at the underlying technology, which I'm really, really, really interested in. And now we are applying that to a regulated market. We're applying that to the tokenization of everything. We're applying that to equities, bonds, uh, fractional ownership, property rights. That's exciting. That's very, very exciting. And I think when you really look at the space of where we are, it's nascent, right? Like it's, it's, it's right at the very early stages. Of course we're going to make mistakes. Of course we're going to um, think that the, the, the industry will go in a certain way and it could pivot. Um, but we've started, and that's what's important. The tech is solid. We're very early stages, and it's very, very exciting. It's going to be interesting to see if it comes out more from the institutional type side or if it comes more out of the tech side. But we've, we've got a better way to do things. But as I said, there is some, there are some major hurdles, and I think some of my panel have talked about already, the custody solutions, uh, the compliance, the AML, the KYC, the secondary trading. And we'll probably get onto all that in the legal and, and regulatory framework. But the good news is, is that we've started. We have a vision. And when we have a vision, then we can make a decision and we can move on. Yeah, and it would seem that you know what you're describing, you know, the, the the structure and the discipline coupled with the regulatory underpinning, you would expect that that would give this staying power, um, and which is which is great to see. I was just oh. going to just add. Um, I just read this interesting thing about 17th century and how people invented this great thing, which was called initial public offering, and uh, people started raising money for various things from insurance, which was which actually made sense to. Um, devices that was were supposed to change chicken uh, chicken into um, sheep, um, and then it went into crazy bubbles like Mississippi bubble in France, and and so on. And I think there is this big fear now that ICOs will just transform into something else. So we're trying to call it. People are trying to call it STOs now, but the objective is the same: to raise capital. Um, I think in many spaces, especially where assets are very liquid, like stock shares. Um, tokenizing them uh, will make sense in future, but maybe right now it would only make them slower or, or worse, less liquid. But for other assets, for real assets, um, the tokenization, the, which is really just splitting it into smaller pieces and making making it, you know it possible that um, that retail investors or or um, people at large can can participate, can buy a piece of something they like, is pretty profound and and really does make sense, um, especially in, in, in closed industries like private funds. Okay, so let's, let's um, shift to another topic um, and, and focus the rest of our discussion on STOs. So, George, um, you know, perhaps we could talk a little bit about the different types of STOs and the application, um, you know, whether it's real assets, um, financial instruments, funds. Um, you know, maybe you could comment on the, the, the merits, where you're seeing um, early momentum, some of the trends, um, you, you know, is this, a, is this going to be a, a new asset class that people focus on in terms of their investment portfolio? Yeah, um, well, I think there were a couple of pioneers, pioneers um, last year and maybe the year before uh, who came up with the, with the, I think, very, very good idea to 
um, to tokenize um, or represent ownership of a, of a, of a private fund um, like venture capital um, on blockchain. Um, and these were a couple of really um, great pioneers like Spice VC, for example. Um, and I see that more and more people are looking into this space and are trying to do it. And I think that it actually really does make a profound sense um, because the venture capital sector is a very exciting sector. And, and I think that many, um, many people would like to participate. Many people would like to invest in a venture capital fund uh, who would not like to you know, have, a, have a go at maybe owning the next Facebook. Um, but at the same time, it's really a domain for the, for the ultra, for the ultra rich, uh, for the few tycoons. And I think this should be um, uh, democratized. It should be open to, to more people. And I think splitting venture capital into smaller pieces and, and allowing um, um, you know, broader or larger group of investors to participate is, is quite profound. What I also think is that um, venture capital, and maybe this is in a way untold story, it's a lot about um, creating the network effect, um, creating the, the kind of, a, oh, let's call it a, a community effect, whereby really venture capitalism is only, so, um, is only as successful as, as large his deal flow is, as many opportunities they can turn down and really find and, and look for the best ones. And I think by, again, by tokenizing, by having a broader and larger um, group of investors, of LPs that, um, that are backing you, you can achieve this. So, I think I really do believe that tokenization makes, uh, makes a strong underlying sense for, for private fund sector like venture capital, for example. I, I would agree with that, and certainly coming from the venture capital background like we are, and we're deploying capital into the space. Um, however, the, the majority of meetings that I go into, and it's a little bit like um, what I've recently seen with Jeff Bezos' first million that he raised for Amazon. He did uh, 66 meetings and um, he raised about a million dollars at a five million dollar valuation for Amazon, um, approximately fifty thousand dollars each. And each meeting that he went into in 1995, every person asked him, "So what is the internet?" And it's unbelievable. What is the internet? And every meeting that I go into, the amount of people that ask me, "So what is this thing called the blockchain?" And it's true. So when you're looking at actually taking in LPs into your venture capital fund, the majority of people out there are, are still, and I'm talking about real capital allocators, fund of funds, family offices, high net worth individuals. Um, the um, role that we tend to take a lot of the time is, is educating. And I think if we were to put a tokenization layer on the fund at, at this stage, it might, it might be somewhat more complex. Um, I definitely see the advantages of it going, going forward. Um, I think it opens up the gates. It allows you to take capital. It allows you to have it in smaller pieces. People say liquidity, although I'm not too sure how that would work because a venture capital firm, certainly like ours, were closed-ended with a seven-year view. So I'm not too sure how, um, how that would work with regards to secondary trading. However, my point being is that we are now in a situation where we are educating we're explaining, we're getting people up to speed about this opportunity. Not everybody sees it like we do. And I really like that. Because for me, that's, a, that's an opportunity to be factually right and look back at the space in 10 or 20 years and have called it right, or look back in 10 or 20 years and go, wow, that was some wild ride we were on. What the hell were we thinking? So it allows you to be factually right or wrong. But I think history will, will, will look kindly on what we're doing. But I think it's a little bit early days. But I, I love to educate. And that's why at SVK Crypto, we do so many things for the community. And I think it's really important to give back and educate. We're all in this together. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with Chain. Sorry, I'm just going to. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with Chain. Blockchain is really a, um, it's, it's a, it's a toxic asset because it's very, um, it's very exciting. But it's very, really complex. It's not, it's not intuitive. So it's hard to understand for people. And that's why the ICO bubble happened. Um, but I think that um, if you want to be the pioneer, you have to start somewhere. And I think that tokenizing something that is wholly illiquid right now is a little bit of an improvement. And that's why if you do it right, um, and the right, in the right jurisdiction according to law and, and rules, then it's maybe the right step forward. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was just going to add to Shane's piece that, that you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm from a traditional brokerage. And any interaction we've had, it seems that the educational piece would have all been done by the likes of yourself. But um, traditional methods of raising capital is, is, is still, you know, is still quite appealing to, to, to those blockchain companies. And I think we'll go through a phase, certainly at the beginning of this year, and, and certainly into the middle of the year at least, where although there's every intention to tokenise 
an asset at a later stage, the initial period of capital raising is it, it, still taking some traditional me yeah. measures and traditional methods. If, if I may uh, add, I do agree with uh, uh, everything that's been said. Um, it's not uh, so common, actually. <laughs> but um, I do agree. I, I would like to add that um, what we've seen with ICOs is that self-regulation doesn't work yet. Maybe it will in the future. Maybe ICOs will return. There's no doubt that ICOs are dead right now. But the main uh, um, factor, in my opinion, is that with STOs, there's no doubt that we need regulation. And um, we've been saying it all along for the last year. But I do think that the regulators have to consider the fact that if they will not take the same securities laws but will make adjustments and make them relevant for STOs, and I'm talking specifically about the fact that um, uh, the tokenization can be a huge deal. I am a big believer in the liquidity in the market, and I do think that we will see uh, in 2019 uh, security token exchanges working uh, properly or starting to work properly um, on the right way. But the regulators have to make these adjustments, otherwise it will kill the market. And as mentioned before, this is not supposed to be just for the rich or the tycoons. This is supposed to be for the public to finally be able to take part in investments that were not possible for them before. And it doesn't matter that we're shifting from ICOs to STOs, we have to make sure that everyone can participate, at least in some way. Okay, so let's um, uh, talk about secondary trading for a few minutes. Um, Alex, could you give us your thoughts around um, what, market, what market requirements there are to support STO growth, um, you know, looking at traditional versus non-traditional um, channels, uh, what potential growth limitations we might have? You know, what, what sort of secondary trading needs to be uh, needs to be in place for this to build momentum? Yeah, I mean, to all to the points we mentioned before, um, issuing tokens not to be traded doesn't make any sense. Uh, I agree on the fact that uh, if we if any company tries to raise capital by issuing tokens just for the sake of it, without having a plan for liquidity, it may not work, and that will be, that will bring us back to the ICO market. So secondary exchanges are critical now, and there are none in the EU for now. I'm being very clear, the Zurich Stock Exchange Fix issued a statement five months ago, Stuttgart the same thing. It's still in the making, and we don't even know when they will be operating for sure and being able to list tokens. ATS is in the US. You have a couple of them operating under ACC uh, in America, but still very, very low volumes and only a two or three operations have been completed in Q4. So what we see is that secondary exchange are critical to, so the market could really mature in the coming months or years. We hope it will be months. Uh, and we agree that 2019 will, be a, will bring a, a real change. If we take the, the case of France, where we are based, um, there is a law coming up, the Loi Pact, which is one of the first law uh, stating, creating a status for broker dealers in crypto assets uh, and custodianship. This law will come in force in March, and we think it will create um, a set of rules that other countries in the EU will replicate or, in, or get inspiration from. Um, we see two main uh, challenges when setting up a secondary exchange. The first is rec tech. I mean, we know that now crypto assets were in a white space in some ways. ESMA, the European Financial Regulator, says we don't know. I mean, crypto assets have no status. Shares, bonds, shares of funds are financial instruments. What are crypto assets? So today, the minimal risk we can assume is that it is a financial instrument, that MIFID and MIFIR will apply to crypto assets, real estate, shares of funds, shares of companies. That being given, we know that we have to submit any exchange to the MTF rules in Europe, which are really heavy, too heavy, which gives legacy players, NASDAQ, Euronext, maybe IC in the States with BACT, which was uh, actually uh, launched in Q4, it gives them an edge in the market. So you see legacy players playing catch up slowly and 
possibly bringing more liquidity. And liquidity beyond reg tech is the other critical aspect. How do you create liquidity when you start an exchange from day one? You're going to wait years before you have the depth required to trade your tokens. So you're going to be stuck with STO token, with, with STOs for years. So what's the point? So we see a real challenge um, in setting up the uh, infrastructure. Again, STOs without exchanges do not make sense for us. And um, hopefully, the EU will catch up. I mean, there is a sandbox in the UK, um, which is very limited and not, re not quite public. Um, people are trying. So the last interesting aspect of exchanges, once they will be set up, is discovery. What if smaller funds, smaller companies you have never met, who are amazing actually, could list on these exchanges, and you may be able to build your portfolio seamlessly on an exchange? That's the first consequence of, ex of exchanges, transparency and liquidity. And obviously, you could imagine having ETFs of funds, ETFs of real assets down the road. So I agree, we are just early in the curve of a new generation of asset management. Half of all assets are liquid. What if just a piece of that, a bit of that, will move to the blockchain, was liquid? It will open up arbitrage strategies that are unknown for now in uh, funds, companies, and bond funds as well. So that's where we are now, and hopefully when we come back next year for the next conference, we'll have an exchange set up in the EU. <laughs> we hope so. I mean, to, to, again, to add to that and to, to look, you know, if, if, if we consider uh, the, the current asset management market and traditional assets, you know, realistically, and any marketing people out there will tell you that you need a two-year number. You need a two-year performance number to sit in front of someone and say, this is my fund, this is how I've performed. So, you know, uh, you, would you expect it to be a shorter time span than that two-year number to create performance? Or, or, or would you just align it to a current model which is out there to attract investors? Well, in our case, I mean, we are kind of a legacy venture capital fund. We've been investing for the last six years, so we have a six-year track record. We never expected to raise capital through an STO. We, I agree. We, are, we, have, we go on typical roadshows with typical investors, and we're trying to educate them about blockchain and the impact of blockchain on our business. How, how do we become better managers? How do they get liquidity or more transparency on the investment. So I agree. I don't believe that you can cut corners. Um, any funds who, are, funds who have limited track record will have a hard time raising capital and trading to their NAV. Um, that's why I think as a paradox, and, and we love innovation and groundbreaking innovation, fortunately or unfortunately, legacy players are going to have a, a say in the market in the coming month. And that's, I think it's the right way to go. I mean, uh, it's, uh, we can't really go from a greenfield uh, from day one. It's still finance and it's still regulated finance. And we tried, people tried to escape it. So there is no, there is no escape from it. And what we've seen just on the exchanges side, um, we've seen a lot of movements behind the scenes. Um, some has actually come out into the news. We're seeing more positioning with almost like, obviously regulated, exchanges for STOs, and I know Archax are here today. I think they're one of the sponsors, which are based in London. Graham was one of the head guys over there. They're doing a phenomenal job of, of getting launched. I think um, in the next sh very short period of time, we have Open Finance and T0, uh, both regulated exchanges coming online. We've also noticed that there has been a kind of a full service suite offering. And when I start to see Coinbase uh, invest into Securitize, um, and I also start to see other platforms like Tokensoft being, being invested into and partnering up with Coinbase. It's looking like they're trying to work out from the actual uh, launch of, of the ICO token all the way to exchange. So the issuance platform joining with the exchange platform where there, there, there can be a KYC and AML embedded into that process. So therefore when you're issuing the STO that you actually have an exchange to actually launch it on, and this will be important for liquidity. I totally agree yeah. with, with our panel. If you don't have an exchange to launch it on, um, I, I think that you're doing yourself a disservice in your investors. But we're starting to see that kind of M&A movements and positioning with, within that structure, and, and that's very much welcome, but very much at the start also. So Shane, yeah. um, you know, that perhaps is a, a segue to another um, question um, around collaboration. I mean, what you mentioned there might perhaps suggest that for this to build momentum and for it to work, um, 
businesses need to think about collaboration. So between issuers and exchanges, between um, investment banks, fund managers. I mean, do you see that collaboration um, and and uh, alliances, partnerships are going to uh, be critical, they're going to be different. Um, how, how do you see that playing out in terms of all this um, fitting together? Oh, I, I absolutely. It's, it's a fragmented market space, and um, in, in order for us to have a, a platform, a, a, a regulated asset class, which, which needs institutional capital to come into it, just like we've seen in the equities and the bonds and the property market, there has to be collaboration, there has to be standard set, there has to be uh, the correct type of institutional type uh, K KYC and AML. There needs to be the auditors, uh, the legal teams. Um, there also needs to be um, from a point of, of auditing, which, which you can't have self-custody. Your auditor, when you go out to raise capital, or you've already raising existing capital, you have to have an auditor do your NAVs. You have to have an auditor step in to prove what you have. Nothing is more difficult than saying to someone that you have a digital token. The auditor really needs to be able to talk to a third-party custodian. The third-party custodian needs to sign off on what tokens you currently hold and the value of those tokens for your investors. So for an order for that to happen, collaboration needs to, needs to um, occur so that everybody can all, all have the same types of ethics and standards to move forward. And, I don't see any pushback on that. I think everybody um, is in a growth and learning phase, and I think everybody's open, and especially the lawyers in the room, they love to come in and bill you and learn from you rather than advise you. They always love telling you what I can't do rather than coming up with a solution what I can. So, and, and the City of London, whereby I hope there's some lawyers in the room today, um, you guys are gonna make some really big bucks on this thing, so stick around, you might get to learn something for today. <laughs> Um, but I think it's I think it's welcomed in all serious um, from all from you know all the professionals involved and we, we will find ways to to solve the problems when we all come together and actually discuss what the requirements are needed. Great. I, I just um, I was just going to add that I, I agree with um, with Shen and, um, and Alex and I think that I didn't actually know about the French regulation but it's very interesting and I think that there is really starting to be a difference between countries so in some countries you really have to pay um, lawyers to tell you what they don't know and what they know. And then there are countries like Switzerland, for example, which um, has started early and has defined quite clear guidance. So in other words, you can go online and download a PDF rather than call a lawyer. And that's a, that's a big difference. So I think it's starting somewhere there. So Damon, um, could you comment on the requirements to facilitate institutional grade infrastructure for the complete life cycle of a transaction and you know, what developments and trends you see uh, related to institutional trading? Sure. So, as, as throughout this uh, uh, panel session, a lot of my uh, fellow panelists have, have, have touched on, uh, um, you know, we are seeing great developments. We are seeing great, great strides in, in moving forward what, what would be needed to, to create an institutional grade environment. And I'm coining a phrase from Graham at Archex there, so I apologise, but um, an institutional grade uh, life cycle. And it, it, you know, in, in the traditional space, we talk about the, the front-to-back process. And, you know, for me to sit in front of, of, of one of my clients, and, and my clients will vary from investment banks, when I say my clients, my company's clients from investment banks all the way through to high net worth individuals with pension funds alike in between. If I'm to talk them through the life cycle of a transaction, it starts at the beginning. It starts at the, at the exchange, at the trading platform. You know, it starts with them understanding that members of that platform are, are abiding to a set of rules, a set of obligations that they need to, that are required by a regulator. It would be using technology that allows a correct surveillance and monitoring process to ensure that the trading on that platform is, is, is fair, is uh, roles and responsibilities for certain liquidity providers, for certain participants. Um, we then have the second phase, which would be uh, uh, clearing and settlement. And we're probably at a stage where the clearing and settlement for a, a, a tokenized asset is, is probably has greater security than the, the current methods for traditional assets in, in non-exchange traded instruments such as a bond or, or so so that's already in place. But then you get the third step, which would be safekeeping custody. And again, we've touched on it down the panel. And there are uh, uh, plans for new entrance to, to becoming a Vontabel in Switzerland announced two, three weeks ago that they was going to be making a, 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 an offering or, or create an offering. This needs to, to continue. We need to see 
custodians of the type that the, the world's biggest pension funds are familiar with, uh, are used to looking after their assets. You know, it's all very well making an investment decision, but to make an investment decision and, and not know if you're gonna get your money back or not is, is, is not really what we can encourage people to do. You've then got the, the, again, what Shane touched on, you've then got the valuation. A valuation of a fund is critical. If you're gonna, if you're gonna encourage people to invest in a product that will value daily, you want a reference point being fair, being clear and being transparent. Um, and then it leads us all the way back to the other side of the coin, which is you've got to be com confident and comfortable that you own something that you can dispose of should it reach the valuation point that you set originally or that you no longer find appealing. It needs a secondary market. So it swings all the way back round to the trading platform, to the exchange again. In 2007, the world's markets went through MIFID 1 and decided that the exchanges had a monopoly over data, over trading, so they encouraged MTFs, SOs, SIs to come into the marketplace. Now, if you want to trade 50,000 Vodafone, you can probably do it in around about 50 plus uh, venues at any one time. So competition isn't a bad thing. It's what the regulator insisted upon 10 years ago. Okay, quite a lot happened since then, but nonetheless, that's what they insisted upon for traditional assets. So new entrance into the market space is, it, on all phases of that life cycle, are imperative as, it, as we go forward. I think 2019, as my fellow panelists have all, all agreed, is gonna be a big year. But it's gotta be a meaningful year. It can't be what we saw in 2017 and just have big numbers flashing everywhere. It's gotta be quality, not quantity. Great. I think we're um, more or less out of time. Um, do we have time for um, questions or do we need to move on to the next? Um Right, okay, well, uh, <laughs> too much. thank you uh, to each of you as panelists. Um, you know, very interesting topic, very interesting discussion, lots of great uh, perspectives and insights. And I, I mean, uh, I, I think it's, it's clear that what we're seeing is the, um, the creation of a lot of structure and discipline, which I think is going to um, provide longevity and, and, um, and stability and, and, and a lot of momentum. So uh, thank you all for your comments and um, we'll pass it, pass it back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much.